That it's always there's always it's good to have blooper stuff. Hey everyone, today's project is an engine replacement in this car. This is going to be a general overview of how to replace an engine. It's not going to be specific for this car and it should give you enough tips for doing this in any other car. Really, an engine is just a single big part like brakes or tires and you wouldn't get rid of a car when it needs tires. So you don't necessarily need to get rid of it when it needs an engine if the rest of it is in good condition. Just to go over some things that you need, obviously you need the replacement engine part. A good jack and some jack stands are helpful, especially if you don't have a lift available. We're gonna be using this though, just because it's easier. A tool that you definitely will need is some kind of hoist. This will help you remove the old engine as well as put the new engine in. And then other tools, are a decent set of sockets. Some flashlights are always handy. Gloves, hearing protection, and eye protection, uh, and just other personal safety items. Hammers, pry bars, a breaker bar for getting loose those rusty and high torque bolts. A nice set of extensions. I like these because they wobble and allow a little bit of flexibility so you don't have to get exactly, you don't have to have the socket exactly square to the fastener. A set of various size pliers. These long needle nose pliers are handy for doing hose clamps. If you have access to air tools this can make your job a lot easier but is definitely not required some ratchets to go along with the uh, socket set some wrenches of the sizes that you might need are helpful especially if there's a nut on the other side of a bolt and you just need to hold that a set of screwdrivers for getting taking off hose clamps and other plastic fasteners as well as some kind of container to catch your fluids and dispose of them responsibly that's going to be pretty much all we need to do this project hopefully we'll be able to get it done in a weekend and this will be the video of that process one last note is if you see sets like this where they have a 230 piece mechanic tool set these are nice for a homeowner but really much more than you need and a lot of it will go to waste. All you need is a decent set of sockets of the standard sizes that your car has. Also, I forgot to lay them out, but sometimes you might need some deeper sockets and some larger sizes. So a couple of these sets are always handy to have as well. All right, let's get started. The first thing to do is disconnect the negative battery terminal. This is especially important in doing something like this because the positive is going directly to the starter and that will have to be loosened to take the engine out and then you have a live wire dangling around all the grounds. The other thing that will make this job much easier is to go ahead and take the hood off. We haven't done that yet, but we're going to and that will allow you to pull the engine straight out and not have anything interfere. Turns out this car and maybe some other cars have a release on the hood hinge to, that allows the hood to go straight up, allowing plenty of clearance to get the engine out. So we went ahead and did that and we're just gonna leave the hood on for now unless it becomes a problem. The last thing, all you have to do is remember an acronym that I came up with, PAFAM. It stands for plugs and electrical. So stuff like the battery, stuff like all the sensors, anything electrical that's connected to the engine will need to be unplugged. The second one, F stands for fluids. Things like the coolant fluid will have to be drained because the radiator will need to be disconnected, as well as power steering fluid and some other fluids may need to be drained to get the engine out. Generally, you wouldn't have to remove the engine oil before taking the engine out. However, it could make your life easier later on to just go ahead and do so. The next letter, A, stands for air. That consists of air going in as well as air going out. The intake and the exhaust are both connected to both the engine and other pieces on the car, so they're gonna have to be disconnected as well. The last letter, M, stands for mechanical. That's gonna be things like this throttle cable and any drive shafts or axles that are connected to transfer the power that the engine makes to the wheels to the road below you. So to get started, we're gonna disconnect the negative battery terminal. <sighs> Another tip when removing things from this engine is make sure to take a lot of pictures because whether or not you use them, if you need them, you'll appreciate it a lot later on. And another thing that's nice to have is some storage bins to keep parts organized 
as you go through the process. As you're taking things off, anything that can be put back sort of where it goes is a good thing to do. That way parts don't get lost and you remember where they go back. Other necessary components for an engine swap are donuts and coffee and later beer. For some models, you might have to remove uh, some extra pieces before you can pull the engine. In this case, we have to remove the power steering pump and the alternator, so we went ahead and took the belt off using a special homemade tool. Also, check and make sure if you need any special tools before you start the job. And any things that you have to remove, like this, could probably be found out if you have a uh, manual for the car, a mechanics manual for the car, or definitely online, that information should be available. One of the fluids that needs to be disconnected is one of the most important, and that's the fuel line. This goes into the fuel rail, and the fuel injectors sit under here. This is generally a pressurized system, and in order to remove it, it's a good idea to release the pressure first. So most fuel rails will have some kind of release on them, and it works very much like the valve you use to fill your tires with air. So you can remove the cap and then use something to depress the valve and that will depressurize the system and now it will be easy to take all the rest of it off. It's a good idea that if you're taking things like intake hoses off of turbos to go ahead and stuff a rag because if a bolt drops down in there and then you try to start it, that's going to be a bad time for everyone. Inevitably, you're going to end up with some kind of fluid on the floor. It's a good idea to have something like this. This is specifically oil dry, but cheap cat litter will work as well. And that will work to both absorb the oil and also uh, make it a little bit safer so it's not slippery. You may also have to remove some of the plastic pieces from underneath just to get access to things like the lower radiator hose to drain that fluid. One of the benefits of using cat litter as oil dry is that you still have the containers and they make perfect recycling containers for things like coolant and oil. It's also helpful to have a bunch of friends when you're doing something like this. So you can have a new engine team and an old engine team working at the same time. Depending on the car, it could be potentially easier to pull both the engine and the transmission out at the same time and then separate them while they're outside the car. Put the transmission back on the new engine and then put them back together as one unit. In this case, it turns out that it's going to be easier to take the engine out separated from the transmission. So what we did at this point is remove the intake manifold so we can get to the starter a lot easier and then we can disconnect that and that will help us separate the engine from the transmission so we can leave the transmission in the car when we go to pull the engine out. On this side, since air conditioning systems are both expensive and unhealthy to take apart and try to put back together, it's always better if you can leave the whole system together uh, when you're taking an engine out and putting a new one in. So right now we're trying to take off the alternator so we can get to the air conditioning compressor and we can leave that in the car and as a complete system. Another handy tool to have is this extendable magnet. So when you drop things and you can't reach them, you can just bring them back. Part of the process to remove the engine from the transmission we have to loosen all these bolts and that can be done by spinning the engine and rotating this around and loosening these out one at a time. And then all we have to do is disconnect the case from the engine block and these two will be able to split and we'll be able to pull the engine out independent of the transmission. Another pro tip when changing an engine is if you're transferring parts from one to the other, line them up so as you take the components off of the engine that you're replacing, you can just go ahead and put them on the engine that will replace it. And that way you both don't lose the parts and you don't forget where they go. And sometimes when you're trying to change an engine in one car, there's another car that needs brakes. So you can do those as well.
This is the part where it really helps to have a lift, but you can do this on your back in the driveway as well. We are now currently loosening and removing all of the transmission bell housing bolts, which connect the transmission to the engine. And this should be one of the final steps before, before we're ready to pull the engine out. But when you're preparing the engine that you get, if it's a used engine, likely they just cut all the hoses and things uh, to get the engine out of the donor car. So you have to do a little bit of prep work by taking all the bad hose ends off first. At this point, we're hooking up the engine hoist to the engine block. Most engines come with a point to lift from. This one has one here and had another one over here, but we had to remove that. So we have a bolt going through the one of the holes in the block down here connected to this chain. And what we're doing at this point is we're gonna take the weight of the engine off of the motor mounts so we can get them loose. And then once we get the bolts out of the motor mounts, this engine should be ready to come out. So now we have everything loose and the engine is suspended by this chain. So we're trying to carefully separate the engine from the transmission and hopefully we'll be able to do that without too much trouble and then we can re remove the engine independent of everything else. We are separating the engine from the transmission. There are guide pins that we need to be able to clear as well as the flywheel and this tooth wheel uh, that's used for the crankshaft position sensor. And we're gently using a pry bar to separate the two components. We're a little bit closer. We have to worry a little bit about clearance on this side. Is it looking okay over there or not? Yeah, so far. Well, no. It's been taking a little bit of finagling, but uh, Look it's slowly back, coming out. Check that back corner. Yeah, also this is... Right now we're just looking for things that might be hanging up or getting caught, or maybe we forgot to disconnect. Are we good back there now? Yeah, I don't know what that was. We just know the coolant line. Oh, hey oh. Back oh. door. Oh. Hold on, it's gotta go down. I gotta lower it. Okay, right clear. Clear. <laughs> All right, we got it out. If you have an old tire, they make great uh, stands from engines. The first part of this engine swap is done uh, and we're done for today. This engine is sitting on this tire. What we'll have to do is take off some of the components that are still on this engine and transfer them over to the new engine. And then also, when you have everything out like this, there are some things maintenance wise that are worth doing, such as putting in a new timing belt, uh, a new water pump, maybe some other things and it's not any it's not much harder to do at this point because you already have the hard part is getting the engine out so you're already up to this point it's kind of silly not to uh, go ahead and do those extra things and if this was a manual transmission at this point it would also be worth changing the clutch because again you're already at this point 90 percent of the work is done it's worth the added extra expense um, in most cases to just go ahead and take care of that maintenance item. And then you don't have to worry about it for several thousand miles um, down the road. So again, that's it for today. Uh, tomorrow is going to be swapping the stuff from this engine to this engine, then putting this engine back in this car. And hopefully that's not uh, we won't have too much trouble and we can go ahead and uh, get this out of here and move on to the next project. It's the next day and our first project for the day 
is to take all of the stuff that we want off of the old engine and put it on the new engine. That's going to include the turbocharger as well as uh, the ignition components as well as some other things from this engine that are either in known working condition or better condition than the ones that we pulled off the other engine. So we're going to get to that and then hopefully get this engine ready to drop in the car pretty soon. And then the next step will just be putting it back in the car. It's also worth noting that the replacement engine is what's considered a long block, which is loosely defined as everything between the valve cover and the oil pan. So all of the internals are already in the engine and we don't have to worry about that. What we do have to worry about is the accessories, which includes the alternator, power steering pump. In this case, the electrical was included, but we're replacing that. The turbo was also included, but again, we're replacing that. Generally, those things may or may not be included in a long block. The alternative is to get a short block, which uh, may or may not have the head on it, and is really just a replacement block that would need entirely rebuilding. This one just needs to mostly be assembled, and then it can be Put back into the car. Right now we are moving all of the timing components including the timing belt, the tensioner, and the plastic cover over to this engine because the timing belt is new. The tensioner, both tensioners are new on the old engine so we know they're in really good shape whereas we they are unverified on this engine as well as this plastic cover because the one that was on this engine is broken and this will help keep this whole assembly much cleaner if we can go ahead and get it on. So we're putting all that stuff onto this engine and setting the timing according to instructions that we found online. That will vary depending on the engine that you're working on and if you even change any of the timing components anyway. Uh, this is another one of those good while you're in there type repairs because the investment that it takes to do it at this point is significantly lower than it would be if the engine was already in the car and then you had to do it later. And now you have the peace of mind to know that this is gonna be good for thousands of miles in the future. We just finished up setting the timing using all of the new components from the old engine and making sure that everything was tensioned properly and adjusted properly to, uh, for this engine to be timed correctly. Um, we suspect that might have been the issue or one of the issues on the old engine, so we wanted to make sure that that was properly done uh, to the best of our ability on this engine. And at this point, we are doing kind of a final walk around to make sure that everything is torqued appropriately and all the hoses and plugs that are easier to put on the engine while it's out of the car and won't be in the way are in fact in the place that they need to be. The old engine is taken apart and stripped down as far as it needs to be for this project. Uh, any further disassembly would just be exploratory out of our own personal interest. But the next step is to move this engine out of the way, put the new one on the hoist, and then shoehorn it back into the engine compartment of this car, and hopefully we'll be able to drive it away later today. We found that the way that we had this engine suspended before worked well for getting it out, but might prove to add some unnecessary complications when putting it back in because it's not hanging uh, exactly flat. It's tilted to the rear or what would be the rear of the car. So we ran out and got a load leveler, which will allow us to turn this crank and balance the engine a little bit better which will allow us to put it in more straight. So we're going to swap out the just the chain for this, and then we're going to be ready to put the engine back in the car. With the help of the load leveler 
and a sling strap. Uh, we now have the engine suspended and it's quite level. Uh, it should hopefully be very easy to just drop it into place. The only thing we have to worry about, well, one of the main things, is this shaft on the torque converter needs to end up in this hole. Uh, so that's the critical factor here. And then if we can do that, everything else should be fine. We've lowered the engine back into the engine bay and delicately got the engine back connected with the transmission and lined up. That was just some slow adjusting, lowering, and making sure everything was lined up. And then they pretty much just came together without too much uh, complaining. Now we're just making sure that no hoses or anything are going to get crushed and anything that needs to be moved underneath the engine before it gets lowered to its final position is in that position that it needs to be. And then we'll be able to start connecting the motor mounts. And once the motor is uh, supported by the motor mounts, then we'll be able to lower down the crane and disconnect it from the chains, which is currently supporting it. And then it's just gonna be a matter of connecting all the various hoses, plugs, uh, and everything else within the PAFAM acronym. We have this motor supported by its engine mounts, so we were able to disconnect and remove the hoist out of the way. Now it's just a matter of connecting all the bits that I mentioned earlier and seeing if it'll start. One thing that we did as a tip is we use some high visibility bright orange tape on a couple of places as something to look for uh, to make sure as a reminder that we go ahead and make sure that's reconnected. Next thing up is connecting the flywheel to the torque converter with these bolts through the starter hole and then the starter. It's the end of day two and everything is almost cleaned up. The engine is in, the accessories are on, most of everything is put back together. I think we got all the plugs, all the hoses. Um, we need to still do the intake and boost pipe. There's a nut under here that goes on the exhaust that we put in high visibility tape just to make sure that we don't forget to put that on. Uh, we do still need to put the belt on, radiator hoses, and all the fluids, and then we'll be ready to try and start it. Um, all in all, this took a little bit longer than we anticipated, but uh, hopefully this was kind of a good overview of what it takes to change an engine in a car, some of the tools that are required and some of the time that it takes. Again, it's there's no real one part that's terribly complicated. It's just a matter of having the patience and organization tools and also the common sense to do this job safely and without hurting yourself or getting frustrated. And really you can bring a lot of life back into uh, an otherwise what might be a junked car. So thanks so much for watching. Uh, please like and subscribe if you're new here um, and you liked the video. Comment with any suggestions or thoughts you may have below. Uh, I'm gonna put as many links in the description to the various tools that I used. Uh, things like maybe a jack, uh, this stand, maybe some of the socket kits, pry bars, uh, various things that we found useful. Uh, check the description for all of that stuff. And yeah, thanks for watching. And uh, I guess I'll see you guys next time.